Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Running Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today. I mean, there is so much happening out there, folks. There is so much happening. And you know what? We are right there, folks. We are right there. Anyhow, today's topic, we're going to have a hell of a topic. We're going to start out today with, and I think it's important that we do that. Religious freedom doesn't allow the faithful to harm society as far as, as for history, look at the case of Typhoid Mary. Perfecto, hermano Miquel Rodnin. Perfecto. Anyhow, uh, right-wing update is what I, I am thinking that I'm going to have to start that kind of stuff back again like I did back in the early days when this show was called Liberal Politics Done Right when it was broadcast out of Canada. But anyhow, folks, uh, right-wing update. Historian on religious freedom COVID-19. That's the title. And American history. That's what we're going to talk about today. And folks, it is very important that we get busy. Anyhow, how are you doing? I always want to try to remember to start the program by giving the kudos to all those people out there that are working their bejesus off or whatever that word is supposed to be to make sure that we are happy, to make sure that we can, well, I, can, I won't say happy, but make sure that we're still surviving, to make sure that things still continue to go relatively smoothly. Um, we have to start looking at all those people that you see at the stores. Look at all those people that you, when you go into, when you go into your grocer and you see that person that is doing all these things that you are not doing because you can stay at home. You have the wherewithal to stay at home. Let's be thankful. Whenever I go out there now, whenever I go to the grocery store, maybe once a week, once every two weeks, or whenever uh, I am told to go, every single person in that store that I pass by, and I really mean this, I am very honest in the way I do it. I'm very humble in the way I do it. I thank them. Because I tell you what, if there weren't people out there that are working at the gas stations, if there weren't people that are working at the grocery store, at McDonald's, and everywhere else that people are working, those of us who have the wherewithal to stay home, we couldn't, we wouldn't. So let's go ahead and give those folks a big thank you again. So all of you out there, thank you so kindly Thank you so kindly. Okay, let's get busy with the show. Uh, subtitle of the show, and I will I better hurry and bring it up because I'm there talking and kind of get wieldy. All right. Right-wing Tea Party-like micro-protests are erupting. Dr. Emma Long discusses how history, COVID-19, freedom, and American history applies. Is the right-wing Tea Party history repeating itself? Is that what's happening? We will get an amplified movement uh, not commensurate with its true size in the age of Donald Trump, or will we? It may seem so, but I tell you what's been happening, folks. If you listen to Katie Turr last yesterday, you listen to uh, Lawrence O'Donnell yesterday, it is clear. It is clear. Thank you very much, Derek Bell. It is clear. That what we have is a people that don't, or, or some in the mainstream media that don't intend to get themselves snowed. So no, 
Uh, we will get an, uh, we won't get that happening at all, at all, at all. In the second part of the program, Dr. Emma Long discusses these issues and more with us. Who is Dr. Emma Long? Emma Long is a joint uh, American studies at UAE, UEA. I, I messed that up earlier today as well. In January 2013, having taken her undergraduate degree, American studies and PhD in history at the University of Kent, Emma was first attracted to American studies as a subject by the idea of a year abroad and has since found many reasons to stay. Emma has fond memories of being in Wisconsin. She's been in Wisconsin, so other than writing about America, talking about America to her class and talking about things like rebuilding constitutions, etc., uh, she was here, so she got to see a lot of our dynamics. So we got into a whole lot of that kind of talking in the interview. I think you're going to like that. But anyhow, let's start the program. Listen to this piece from Dan Patrick. He's a lieutenant for those of you outside of Texas. Dan Patrick is the right-wing radio sh <coughs> former radio show host in Texas. And now he's the lieutenant governor of Texas. That's likely the most powerful position in Texas, more powerful so than the governorship. So let's listen to him on his interview and then we'll take it on the other side because what he has to say, what Dan Patrick has to say has a lot to do with the mentality of the people that you see in the video that I will show thereafter. So let's listen to Brother Dan. Thanks so much for coming on. So sure. you were... Um pretty clear in what you thought might happen in our conversation a month ago. You said if this, if they don't pull us back a little bit, you're going to see a lot of people out of work and you're going to see the economy crushed. Do you think you've been vindicated? Uh, well, I, I'm sorry that I'm vindicated. I wish it hadn't happened, Tucker, but I'm a small business guy and I've been around the block long enough to see what was going to happen. When you sh start shutting down society and people start losing their paychecks and businesses can't open and governments aren't getting revenues and go on and on and on and on. So I'm sorry to say that um, I was right on this. And, and I'm thankful that we are now Tucker, finally beginning to open up Texas and other states because it's been long overdue. You know, they told us, Tucker, to follow the science. Well, what science? I mean, at the end of January, Dr. Fauci, who I have great respect for, said this wasn't a big issue. Three weeks later, we were going to lose two million people. Another few weeks later, it was one to 200,000. Now it's under 60,000. And we've had the wrong numbers, the wrong science. And I don't blame them but let's face reality of where we are. In Texas, we have 29 million people. We've lost 495, and every life is valuable, but 500 people out of 29 million, and we're locked down, and we're crushing the, the average worker. We're crushing small business. We're crushing the markets. We're crushing this country. And what I said when I was with you that night, there are more important things than living, and that's saving this country for my children and my grandchildren, and saving this country for all of us. And I don't want to die. Nobody wants to die. But man, we got to we got to take some risk and get back in the game and get this country back up and running. Wow. <clears throat> I want to decompress that, okay? There are more important things than living is what he said. He's saying, "Let's go ahead and open back the economy. There's more things than living." And by the way, welcome aboard Rose Williams. Welcome aboard Sean Christian. Welcome aboard Derek Bell. Welcome aboard Michael Rutnin. Hey, folks, listen. Uh, let's see. Sean and Derek is on, on uh, YouTube. Rose and Michael on, on Facebook. Folks, come on in. And by the way, if you're just joining us, please remember, remember what we need most of all is for you to share the programs. Please go ahead and share these programs. That's the way we ensure that we get a whole uh, lot of participation. I want to get more live participation. We get a whole lot of podcast participation after the fact. I don't know if it's because of the time that we do this, but uh, I would love to kind of foment a bit more, uh, bring in a bit more people in real time. So whatever you can do, share, 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 por favor. That's what we need to do. Uh, welcome aboard Irene Tolman Moser. Welcome aboard. Anyhow, here's the deal. Brother, our Lieutenant Governor, Dan Patrick, says there's more, th there's more than living because they don't want... The, 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 welcome aboard Norman Reynolds. They don't want the economy to crater any further, right? They want this vibrant economy to come back. By the way, let me, let me warn you guys of something. A cratering economy doesn't mean death to the people. A cratering economy means we live more modestly until we get back into consumerism. 
But what I think a lot of people are going to find out is less consumerism leads to a much better quality of life for many. And those who want to continue consumerism can. But what I think is a lot of people are going to find a new form of living. I think a lot of people are going to start looking at your credit card bills and where their heads used to be hot at the end of every month, like, did I really spend that? They're going to notice, uh, oh, wow, just living a simple life and using the things right there at home and eating a little bit more at home saves quite a few hundred dollars, if not several thousand dollars a month. A lot of people are going to find that out, and a lot of folks are going to have a different thing. But here's the deal. He's talking about there are things more important than life. Now, note he wants to tell you consumerism is more important than life. Okay, But here's the kicker. How comes they never say that when it comes to issues like uh, abortion, right? A woman's, uh, a woman's being responsible for her own body. If he thinks that he thinks our economy could be more important than life itself, in other words, he is willing to sacrifice a few people who will die to save the American economy. I am happy that he said that. Because under that same morality, he should realize that a woman's pregnancy has economic effects as well. A woman's pregnancy can determine her entire economic, uh, her economic outcome if she never wanted to get pregnant. And she did. So it is amazing for these males how when there are issues that are particular to a lot of males or that males are involved as well in, that the purpose of life, the sanctity of life, doesn't really hold as much in this case, but the sanctity of life when it comes to keeping the economy going means everything. What hypocrisy. I want you guys to think about that. So I'm going to say it in a soundbite that I can go ahead and post later on because this is important. Dan Patrick and the right wing and the Tea Party and Republicans believe that a few lives are worth it to keep the American economy in the current state that it is in meaning a vibrant economy that matters to a few, but they are against one life. They are against a woman's life that may be set array, awry for the entire, her entire life economically because they believe the sanctity of a fetus is worth more than the totality of that woman's life. But the sanctity of the life of grown people it's not worth, it's rather, it's worth, or the death of that grown person is worth dying for to keep the economy at bay. Now, I want, I want you guys to understand that because I don't hear that argument on TV. I don't hear that argument. I don't hear how they don't, whenever, when they interview Dan Patrick or when they interview uh, like a, a woman in the, the mayor of Las Vegas that I'm going to put up tomorrow, why don't you bring that up? If you believe a few lives are worth it, then aren't a few lives worth it if a woman's entire outcome will be different? Of course it is. And first of all, that is the assumption, that is if you assume an unborn fetus, a blastoma or whatever, is a life. Personally, I don't. But who am I? I am not a biologist, so I don't know that kind of stuff. But, if we want to be morally consistent, if we do not want to be intellectual hypocrites, then we have to look at it that way. So you wonder why is it that people can have these, we call it uh, these way, ways of thinking, trastornados, trastornados, these ways of thinking that are uh, convoluted. Why? When you hear a Dan Patrick like that, it is not hard to see why our brothers and sisters on the right fall into the trap. Because they, they say it with such passion, they say it over and over again, and what they don't want to say, they don't. So they will never bring up abortion in that discussion there. Because we'll say, uh, we, we, we've always noticed that, that you don't mind the life of an adult. We've always noticed that. You doubt me? 
Think about this. Think about the policies that the right supports. They don't want things like midnight basketball. Well, midnight basketball in the days of Clinton saved a lot of lives, right? Because guys that would have been on the outside doing no good, getting in trouble, having a gun, shooting up each other, they were busy competing in playing basketball. Let me tell you something. If you think those guys running around with guns don't much prefer sitting playing, a ba- playing the fun thing of basketball than shoot them up and running from cops. No, it is something to do. If they, if they, it, who would cut food stamps even now for kids that will have a material effect on their lives and some of them will die from malnutrition or from poor nutrition if they really cared about life. But they only care about life of a fetus when it makes an ideological sense, right? How come they lock so many people up or believe in these policies that lock people up where we know once you get a sentence to the pen, your life is over? So let's, let's, get, let's talk about honesty and let's start not letting them get away with these things. But talking about the protests, I want to show you the evil within and then we'll take it on the other side. Only 12% of Americans think it is not likely that there would be a surge in COVID-19 infections if everyone in America suddenly went back to work tomorrow. From that 12%, there has sprung up a tiny, and I mean tiny, band of protesters who represent just a very, very tiny fraction of 1% of the population, way, way, way less than 1% of the population, a few thousand people across the country at most in a country of 330 million people. And those protesters want everything to go back to normal tomorrow. We do risk amplifying the protesters' dangerous message by paying too much attention to them. But we think it's worth seeing one moment of the protest to show just how sick some of these protesters already are. In this video, you will see one of the brave frontline heroes in this fight, a nurse in Denver yesterday, standing in front of a vehicle containing a woman who screams at the nurse to go to China. A nurse who is standing there to save that woman's life, a nurse who remains standing there after the woman tells that nurse to go to China. Now think about that. A nurse go to China. You wonder... Where, what cocoon these people are living under. You know, when they talk about, go ahead and open the government. The reason they can feel or they can act this way is that they have been given permission from the churches that they go to, to their leaders like Dan Patrick and all the other Republican leaders that follow this negative path. They feel empowered to say this, but not only empowered, but they feel that it's okay. I have relatives that I will look at their Facebook pages. And when I see it, these are intelligent relatives. When I see the page, I shake my head. First of all, in shame that they're relatives. First of all, in shame. Because we all grew up together and we all had the same intellect. We all had the same education. We had all had the same rearing. And you see this blind support for a sect in this country that makes absolutely no sense to the rational mind. No sense to the rational mind. What happens is, I, I've told this story before. Once I decided to start listening to Rush Limbaugh, they in, this several years ago, Day in and day out. I, re- I wanted to see what it was like. And I listened to Rush Limbaugh. And I'm going to tell you something. Because all these people have a little bit of truth within what they're saying. They have a modicum of truth, right? Within what they're saying. It gives a tendency of the mind. I'm just telling you how the mind works. The next time you have or you see something... Your mind, because it is in the process of being rewiring through this kind of info, 
have a tendency to first, not the intellectual portion, but the animal portion, tends to go there. So it's insanity. It is psycholog it's a psychological thing. It is an insanity. And that is the reason why I can work with my folks on the right. That is the reason why I can continue to love my folks on the right. That is why I can continue to work with my folks on the right. Because I feel that just like, just like me having listened to Rush Limbaugh for a long time and have seeds planted, our seeds, and I'm not just talking about me, you guys got to do it as well if we're going to change the whole country, right? Those seeds as well get planted into them. And I have experience in that happening, in folks later on, unsolicited, unsolicited coming to you and saying, hey, man, you know, you remember when you were saying that? Man, uh, I guess you're right, you know. I guess you're right. I've even had folks come back and say, hey, you know what? Um, I've been, I'm ashamed. And my first thing to that person is, no shame, man. No shame. No shame. Welcome to the fold. Let's move on. Now you have a, you have a big job to do. Because what happens when you've already, when you've turned somebody, and not you turned somebody, they turned themselves. But when they left themselves open to the truth, their biggest problem is going back into their fold. Because what happens then is peer pressure takes over. Peer pressure takes over and it's hard for them to do what it is that they need to do. But I mean, it's becoming time for me to go ahead and put... Uh, Emma Long on, Dr. Emma Long. Dr. Emma Long, uh, I found her through a, a podcast and, uh, that I listened to, and I really liked what she had to say. So I contacted her and went ahead and gave her, sent an email, told her who we were, and said, hey, I know you're in England, or in, you're in England, but can we go ahead and tape this stuff right now? I, I love what you had to say. Can I talk to you right now? And I just did it on a whim, hoping that she'll say, Yes, and I got an email back and said, sure, if you do it within the hour, we can do it. Because, you know, they're way ahead of us out there. So I said, okay, okay, send me uh, something so that I can really start working on a header. And she made it happen. So I want you to listen to Dr. Emma Long, and then we'll take it on the other side. So here we go, Dr. Emma Long. Welcome to another segment of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. I am honored to have Dr. Emma Long, PhD, with us today. Who is Dr. Emma Long? She is a senior lecturer in American Studies at the University of East Anglia. For those who don't know, that is in the UK. She has interests in religion, law, and quite a bit more. But let me tell you what got my... Well, I'll tell her first. Welcome aboard, Dr. Long. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, absolutely. So let me tell you, one of the things that um, excited me about interviewing you is I, I watched a podcast of you earlier today, and uh, you are somebody from outside of the United States who lived in the United States, who likes to study the United States. And I think we are, and I think we are one of, we are a country now that is do a hell of a lot of study based on what's occurring out here. And I noticed that you are into both religion and you're into history. And I think there's a hell of a lot of inter intersectionality occurring in that regards in the United States right now. Certainly. In the, the U.S., I mean, religion's been a major part of American history in lots of, um, lots of different ways and lots of different areas. But yes, it's certainly coming to the fore um, in well, in, in recent years, with uh, President Trump making overt um, appeals to the religious community, um, and particularly in the context of the COVID-19 outbreak, that's, there's some tensions there that are, are coming to the surface in the debates about how the governments of the states and the federal government should respond to it. Now, I find it interesting that you, you, know, you started out with Donald Trump and about Donald Trump seeking uh, his support from the religious base, specifically the evangelical base in the United States. Don't you, as uh, looking in, find that a bit ironic knowing the history or his moral being, if you will? Uh, I think to a lot of outsiders, it's, it does seem very strange. And in fact, there's a divide in the evangelical community over 
the extent to which evangelicals should support um, Trump and, and his his policies. So it, it's not a not necessarily straightforward connection. Um, but yes, I think to to a lot of people outside of the politics, particularly conservative politics in the, the United States, it does seem like a, a strange connection between people who who speak about living a Christian life and and following the the demands of the, the requirements of the Bible. Um, with uh, a man who, to a lot of people, simply doesn't doesn't embody those um, those qualities in, in any way, shape, or form. Um, the response to to that from many evangelicals is that everybody is a sinner, and everybody has the opportunity to um, to to repent, get better, and so on. so. Um, those arguments have been around really since. Uh, Trump was a candidate before he was was elected, and I think they're they're well rehearsed in um, in discussion about Trump's uh, religiosity or otherwise. No, doesn't uh, y y you talk about everybody being a sinner? Doesn't that doesn't you know being reaccepted or the like comes with something called atonement for what one has done? And then he wants say he doesn't think he needs to ask God for forgiveness for anything. Uh, yes, he did indeed, which makes that argument a rather difficult one to uh, to make. Um, but there are people who are willing to hear that argument. No, I, I find that the, a lot of the evangelicals may be transactional here with the mm -hmm. with with our president, and and that is that they may think that uh well they they are getting all that they need out of him. But I heard on a podcast that um, you did. Were you brought in the word that the Tea Party has been using for some time, that many in these areas use, and that is freedom and not only having to do with Christianity, but the, 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 I guess it's that interface between government and religion. Why don't you expand on that? Um, sure. So there are a number of different debates here, but of course you've got religious liberty, the uh, freedom of religion embedded in the, the US Constitution, um, and debates about what that means and how far that goes have obviously been a major part of American politics, um, certainly in the, the last half century, but have really come to the fore in the last 20 years or so as conservative activists have really sought to um, use the judiciary and the legal language to build a, a case for the protection of the rights of largely Christians in the, the United States. And um, that narrative has fed into a, a debate about how far religious liberty is the primary requirement or whether it's one of, of many requirements that sort of has to take its place amongst the other um, provisions of the, the Bill of Rights. And the, you know, the, the debate has been about where that comes in relation to other things when, that, when the right of religious liberty comes up against other rights. Now the classic one in, in recent years, of course, has been uh, the debate about LGBTQ rights when religious groups um, argue that their their faith simply cannot accept um, homosexuality and uh, the way in which people of faith who have those views can refuse service, thinking about recent Supreme Court case, um, among uh, about whether they they have to accept marriage equality. So it's been on the agenda for a, a very long time and of course it, it's a, a really fundamental issue because it is is putting people who really strongly hold to their beliefs in collision with each other now in your studies uh when you do a comparison let's say of the united states in regards to these many of them call them moral issues i really call them ideological issues mm -hmm. uh let's say whether it's be uh, gay marriage or whether it is uh women ascension or any one of those issues how do you find that that compares to what happens let's say in england or the other parts of the western world we don't really want to take into consideration others right now because i see it another dynamic how do you find that comparison what's going on in america now compared mm -hmm. to what's going on on the other side of the pond yeah. 
I mean, in, in many ways, there are some of the same debates here. We have an evangelical Christian population, although it's it's neither as large as it is in the United States nor as influential. Uh, I think part of the, the fact that it, it's become such a major issue in the United States is actually, ironically, because of the Constitution, because these battles are presented in the sort of winner takes all terms for the meaning of the constitution, the meaning of the first amendment. Um, it makes it much harder to find areas where there might possibly be compromise. Whereas in the, the UK, we don't have that. We, we do have a constitution, but it's largely unwritten and it, it's made up of the laws that exist at any particular moment in time, which means it, it's not it's not quite such a battle in the, the same way. So there is room for discussion and negotiation and compromise and finding middle ground. But the nature of American politics, as it's become increasingly polarized, and not just in the, the last 20 years, but in the last 40 years or so, means that it, it has, it's, it's become that kind of winner takes all and reaching across the aisle and finding middle ground simply hasn't become possible. And so these debates ramp up and up and, and up. Um, and that's entirely separate from the fact that obviously people on both sides feel very strongly separate from the political issue. Um, so finding a middle ground may actually be be difficult, even if the politics of it weren't weren't there. Now, you really think that the Constitution itself, the, the way our Constitution or the Constitution of the United States is written, is part responsible? Uh, I mean, or is it, is, it, is it part responsible or is it an excuse of a document uh, that can be interpreted? And hell, we have a, a Supreme Court that says we are the ones who interpret the Constitution in however manner we want to. Which one is it? Well, I mean, the, the Constitution is as, as written, so it, it's not the Constitution so much as it is the, the way that um, the Constitution has been used right. uh, by people on both sides of, of the, the debate. Um, and this this has a, a long history, but particularly since the, the Warren Court of the 1950s, um, you know, the, the Warren Court undertook this sort of massive so-called rights, rights revolution, which expanded the, the rights of, of both civil rights and civil liberties for, for in protected individuals against the, the role of the state and in, interpreted the constitution in that way. Um, you then sort of get a, a conservative backlash mm -hmm. to, to that, which says that's not the way that it, it should go. And if you're going to use the constitution to do it, we're going to find ways of using the constitution to, to challenge that and so the constitution and the provisions of the constitution and the, the cases that have come have been marshaled by both sides to fight each other so it's not necessarily in, inherently in the constitution although i think you could probably have a very long debate about whether it is or, or isn't um but in terms of the issues that we're, we're talking about here it is the way that, that sides have used the constitution and the fact that many of the that the constitution becomes the go to the, the first <laughs> yes. point of, go to, to try and find resolution rather than potentially trying to find it elsewhere and that of course has only become even more so since um with the, the polarization of, of american politics with a congress that, that can't agree and therefore doesn't get things done or, or you can't find compromise in the political realm where else do you go well in the, the u.s system you go to the, the courts um, so it's yeah, it, it's a combination of factors that has has brought brought it in this form. Um, okay. Now you say that England has the, its own constitution that really, for all practical purposes, I don't know how you follow it. I listen to the House of Commons all of the times, and um, it's a ruckus. I enjoy it actually. I think that we should probably learn a few things from doing it that kind of a way. But you have a parliamentary system; we don't. Um, but um, do you ever find that the adherence or the attempt to adhere to a document that is over 200 years, somehow why should, a lot of, why should, a, should it have such an applicability with a society that is so different than the society that was there then? I mean, in, in fact, I have very little, uh, I, I, well, I'm original from Central America, but uh, having been naturalized an American citizen, 
even as such, I have very little use for the United States Constitution <laughs> after studying it and realizing, hey, uh, they were, for, for voting classification, they didn't mind considering me three-fifths of a man or that, you know, I, I don't find that um, these, these wise guys that were so great and that we adored, you, that we adorn, I don't, I have loyalty to the people that are doing good now. I don't know that I have much loyalty for the past. Tell me why should I have loyalties uh, otherwise? Um, I think that there may be something about being an outsider mm. and, and not having been brought up with the constitution as the thing that, that is there that you, that you revere. And certainly I know when I talk to my students about the American constitution, one of the things we sort of say is you have to stop putting it on a pedestal. It, it, yes. it was written, it, it's a historical document. It was put together by people who were responding in the best way that they knew how to the situation in which they found themselves in the context in which they they were. It's all, you know, we can hold them to contemporary standards, but they were people of their time for good or for, for ill. Um, the difficulty i think for, for me with your question is that i'm a historian by by training and so i spend a lot of time looking at why things have become where they are so why people revere the constitution in the way that they do why it's become important why the debates have, have come up around it uh, which makes it kind of difficult for me to take a step back and say should we just get get rid of it um i, I don't know that i'm kind of so embedded in trying to understand it as it is but taking a position on whether it's you know whether you know the united states should simply get get rid of it and start again is um is something that's rather hard for me to to take i mean the, the reality is it's not going to, to happen um, it is so embedded in American culture and American political life. And the reality is that given where American politics is right now, even if you tried to completely reshape government, I'm not sure you'd manage to, to do it. I think one of the um, one of the, the real achievements, if you like, of the, the founders when they, they put this together was that despite everything that was going on, they did actually find areas on which, which they could compromise now. You can, you know, there there are problems there, but if you compare the you compare that to to what might be possible now, um, it's an exercise I have my students do as well is to to write a constitution the way that they they think it should be, and then talk about how realistic it would be to to get that passed. And you suddenly realise how how difficult, difficult. that is. I agree. I, I must agree. Now, l let me jump to England or, or to the United Kingdom uh, real quickly, just for a quick short, uh, a short question. Do you guys have any type of debates on the fundamental nature of the creation of your union? Your, I know there, there's a whole lot of historicals between Ireland and England and, and uh, Welsh. And, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I understand that. But do you all ever have those kinds of discussions that we have here? It's uh, it's been more of a debate in recent years, actually. Um, if you're familiar with uh, the Brexit debate yes. and um, Britain's misguided, should we say, decision to leave the European Union um, back in in 2016, and finally having started that that process at the beginning of, of this year, uh, because ultimately Scotland, um, part of the the UK, but a mm -hmm. country in its own right historically and and in many ways today, um, the majority of the population in Scotland voted to to Stay. remain in yes. the, the UK, um, and so there there have been debates sort of since 2016, and in fact a couple of years before that there was a, a referendum vote in Scotland about whether Scotland would be an independent country. So actually in recent years there has been more of a debate about the, the nature of the union and, and inevitably once you start having debates about the the relation of Scotland to England you then start having discussions about the relationship of Wales to England and the the question of, of Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland's relationship to um, the Republic of Ireland and also Versus, to, yeah. yeah of course that that has its own uh, that has its own complicated history right was also fed into to debates about Brexit. So if you'd have asked me 10 years ago, I would have said that growing up here, there hadn't really been a, a debate about that, although I grew up in England. So it's possible that, that there are more of those, there were more of those debates in, in Scotland, Wales and, and Northern Ireland. 
but in the last few years yeah it, it's it's come to the surface a little bit more but certainly not um not quite in the same way as we're used to seeing in the us where it seems like almost every other political debate is about some kind of fundamental principle that relates to the the constitution and the nature of the, the union um and we're, we're seeing it again actually at the the moment the the protests over um state lockdowns right. uh, over COVID-19 and the, uh, the question of what power and influence the president may or, or may not have to, to shape governors' responses to, to that um, is a, a reflection of that, that question in the, the US about the relationship between states and the, the federal government that goes right back to the, the founding. Well, you brought that full circle to my last question, which has to do with the protests that we've been having here in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, they're very small, but as usual, the right wing has a way of commanding more TV audience than the left when they may get 10 or 15 people and they get the response that 100,000 people would get mm -hmm. on the left. But anyhow, that's another subject. Um, uh, these people are really uh, fighting about their freedoms to go out and work. So the last question is this. When does the freedom of others in, with respect to a disease like COVID-19 impacts on the freedom, impact on the freedom of others? And how do we mitigate that? Because I think right now, a person deciding that they want to go out there irrespective with a disease, they also put my life in danger. Yeah, and of course, everywhere is having these debates. We're having them in the UK, where we have a similar kind of lockdown, although the government doesn't like using that that term. Um, so yeah, there, there are real questions about that that balance. And in, in some ways, it's a, a much bigger question. It's about questions of social responsibility and the responsibility that you as an individual have to the community in which you, you live. It's a question about the American economy and the, the nature of a, an economic system that is, is based so heavily on informal, uh, sort of informal contracts and zero hours contracts and the, the gig economy, which means many people have been very badly hurt um, by the, the, the lockdowns and people's need to put food on the table, which of course is a genuine con concern. Um, a lack of a, a really strong social welfare program um, here in the, the UK. The government has, has instituted uh, programs to try very hard to protect jobs, um, to keep people employed by subsidizing um, to a certain extent the um, companies, uh, company's salary base so that hopefully once things begin to get back to, to normal, um, people will go back to work and therefore, it, you know, we're not dealing with a, a higher level of, of unemployment, but the, the US has a very different system to, to that. Um, and people are, are concerned. I mean, I personally um, feel safer right now staying at home. Um, you know, we, we have a, a lockdown, you see all these terrible stories about the, the loss of life and you hear these really heartrending stories about um, people whose loved ones have passed away. They've not been able to go visit. They've passed away alone because of the restrictions on, on COVID-19. Um, I think at the, the moment, all the, the science seems to suggest that we are better off staying at home and not spreading it. And the, the longer that we resist doing that, the, the longer this is going to, to go on. Uh, but, the, you know, Aside slightly from the, the kind of the, the politics of, of liberty and um, what was it President Trump tweeted, liberate these, these states, which is um, incendiary at, at best, um, then, you know, they're, they're people have genuine concern, concerns here about how they how they feed their families. And I think you know, there, there are questions to be asked in the, the longer term about that side of of things um that i you know that there, there is that as part of this debate as well as the political aspect of the, the debate which is that we don't like big government big gov federal government doesn't get to tell us what to to do we have the right to live our lives the way that we um the way that, that we want irrespective of, of anything 
else, which I think is a slightly different debate from the some of the more pragmatic concerns that people have. More than the science pragmatic. Well, look, Dr. Emma Long, it was my pleasure to have you here. Dr. Emma Long is a senior lecturer at the American Uni uh, of American Studies at the University of East Anglia. And folks, that's in the UK. Don't make the mistake I made before. Anyhow, thank you so kindly for having been here with Politics Done Right, Dr. Long. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, um, uh, I, I hope you enjoyed that. I, I had a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed listening to her when she spoke. Now, I'm go what I'm going to do right now is jump to the boards, listen to what you guys have to say. But there's one uh, thread that I've been following uh, from, of course, my good friend. And watch, now he explodes. My good friend, Daniel Lado. He still has this beef about three-fifths of a person, right? The reason Daniel Ledo likes to talk and they have to really try to find a justification for the compromise that made me three-fifths of a man is that that immorality, that thing that took away my humanity, they need to find a way to say, no, that's not true. There was a real reason why they did that as a compromise. There was a real reason. So the only reason we accepted you as three-fifths of a person is that, well, look, the fact that, and, and I'm going to just say this as a statement of fact, and I don't need to go research on Google. I don't need to research on anything. And for my dear brother, beautiful progressives online, you need not go to Google to research anything about them having called black folk three-fifths of a person. The fact that they categorize a particular race of people as three-fifths when counting no matter what is evil. Don't let anybody try to find justification. The document, when written, had several evils in the document. There were many things in this country that were, that, that, that were done that were evil. Let's not run away from it. Let's just say that we grew up, every country, every person has committed and done things they did not want to do, they should not have done, or they didn't know was wrong. It doesn't matter. It is okay. It is not okay, but we understand it is what makes us human. Let's not try to deify the founding fathers for having called me three-fifths of a person. Don't ever try to do that. It, it undermines the intelligence of people. The document made a whole lot of errors that women weren't really part of the voting or were not really counted. That people who didn't own land didn't have that much power. It's not a democracy or constitutional republic or whatever the hell you want to call it. Let's be frank here. The document was a very, very flawed document for many. It was a solid, good document for those who wrote it because all from the economic stance and further, furthermore, the constitution is an economic document. Or I should call it a... a, a, a uh, what, what does um, David, David Cobb, a, a, a preeminent expert on this stuff, calls it a, uh, a property document. Let me tell you, let's get frank here. There are a lot of, there, there are good points to that darn document, but there is a hell of a lot of bad points to that document. And for those people who had to live through it to get past the 10 amendments, they know it. Okay? Black people, Indians, women, all these people had to be, uh, uh, the, the, the aggrieved people had to be then protected later on with amendments to the Constitution. So let's not deify or make these guys the best thing since apple pie that had so much genius and foresight. They didn't. They tried to create a country that would work and they did. Good job. But let's not dare try to deny the pain of women. Do not dare deny the pain of black people. Do not dare deny the, pe the, the pain of the indigenous from the walk, uh, from, from the walk, the trail of tears all on, on. Let's not dare disregard all the negatives, the savagery that occurred under these people. Let's not do that. You are, and that is why a lot of people around the world 
when you come and talk to them about democracy without atoning, when you talk to them about freedom without atoning, when you talk to them about all these things you want them to do, all they have to do is turn around and say, but didn't you do that yourselves? And aren't you a good people now? When we talk about our big concern about North Korea dropping the bomb or that Russia dropping the bomb or India dropping the bomb or Pakistan dropping the bomb. Remember, the only, the only country that has ever used a nuclear bomb on other human beings, we were the only country that did that. So let's be clear here. You can sing glory, glory, hallelujah until you atone and be what we claim we are. Nobody is listening. Remember that. Yes, you can have the most powerful army in the world. You can have the most powerful weapons in the world. And that gets people to stay rather quiet. But not because one is quiet. Mean they do not understand what you're all about. And at some point in time, time coming soon, you are going to see that the good is going to emerge. That good people are the ones that are going to eventually emerge out of all this thing. Because a whole lot of times, when you plant stuff, you plant a lot of stuff in crap. But out of that, good stuff comes. So please, don't undermine. You don't have to. I mean, there's no hatred here. There are no lies here. There's not one thing that I just stated that wasn't true. You name me one thing that I just stated that was a lie. Please do. Mr. Ledo, you said, whoa, such lies and hatred from Egberto. I guess this works for people who buy into his lies. Tell me, you, you have the platform, Mr. Ledo, or you can give me a call at 646-716-5812. What lies have I just told? Name me one, sir. Name me one lie that I've just told. I doubt that you, not I doubt, you simply cannot because I didn't. Anyhow, I love all you guys that are here with me today. Welcome E from YouTube. Rose William, welcome aboard. Nice seeing you again. Actually, Rose, the other day I replayed your interview. That is a wonderful interview that you gave on, on, on uh, Medicare for All. Uh, Daniel Ledo, welcome aboard. Michael Rudnin, welcome aboard. Uh... Irene Tolman Moser, welcome aboard. Uh, I think I saw Mike Sisak, welcome aboard as well. Uh, who am I missing? Who am I missing? Who am I missing? Look, guys, welcome all of you. Uh, of course, my brother Norman Reynolds, uh, Sean Christian, uh, welcome aboard as well. Derek Bell, welcome aboard. All right, I'm going to go through this real quick because I only have like four minutes. So let's see. Religious freedom does not allow faithful, faith, the faithful to harm the society. I agree with you right there, Michael Rudnin. Uh, Michael Rudnin, I'll say healthcare workers and supply the maintenance workers are essential workers. Absolutely. Everyone else should stay home. Absolutely. Derek Bell says, keep up the good work, brother. Vote can not have this mess handled this crappy way next time. Keep up the good work. I will honor you, my brother, Derek Bell. Uh, Sean Christian, the overpaid are off their estates and mansions while the essential and under paid or forced to work. So true, so true, so true. Hi, Rose. Uh, let's see. Michael Renison, willing to risk other lives for his own profits and those of his cronies. Exactly right. Norman Reynolds says, hi, everyone. Son Christian says, work is an act of self-preservation, means of improving one's life. There's a word for that, and it's called it not so, and it's called, and it's not as good. Irene, let's say hypocrisy at its best. I imagine you're uh, talking about something that I said. Boy, conservatives are real as something. I mean, it's amazing, man. It's amazing. Uh, Iran, Irene Talman Moser said, protesters holding signs that say, my body, my choice. Yet I would give them money. <laughs> you got that right, Irene. You're absolutely right. Irene Tolman also said, bet money. I, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, Lawrence Sims, my brother, says, the argument about lives versus money to pay for health care for people was different from... Uh, these same people went fighting against Obamacare. Oh, so true. You are a very smart man, Lawrence. Lived it says, very accurate. And, uh, of course, Irene comes back with the, ch the chime. Unbelievable ignorance. Rose Williams says, frontal lobe versus amygdala. 
Exactly. My daughter talks to me about that all the time, Rose. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Michael Rodney says, U.S. Constitutional First Amendment, Congress shall make no law, make no law respecting, let's see, make no law respecting. So I, I can't read. My eyes just kind of did a number on me. Okay, Rose William, I guess, no, that's a joke between the two of you. Okay, let me see. I think I just got some new messages. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Rose Williams says, thanks, Egberto. I can be here today because one of my student terms has postponed until tomorrow. Yeah, well, I mean, I tell you what, that, like I said, that was a very good interview and I played it again. Daniel says, there is hatred for men who tried to give people that look like you semblance of humanity in an age that saw them as property. That brother is disgusting. That is a rather, I, I won't call it what it is. In other words, a group of, White guys considered me a slave. They, I, I want you guys to see how, how these guys think. Because Rud, uh, Ledo just thought he, he, that he, he said a good point. I know a lot of people think that. He just thought he said something magnanimous. Listen to what he's saying. A group of white guys had me as, slave, as a slave. I was a slave. This black dude was a slave. And then comes... And then comes another set of white guys that says, hey, he's not a slave. He, you know, I, I want to give that black guy some humanity. So, okay, I'll negotiate with you. We'll give that black guy because according to Ledo, let's go what Ledo says. There is hatred for men who tried to give people that look like you some semblance of humanity. In other words, these other white guys... They took their authority to want to give me a semblance of humanity. How nice those white guys, the founding fathers who didn't want slavery, who some of them themselves had slaves, who didn't want slavery. So they're going to talk to these other white guys to give me a semblance of humanity. I don't need either set of these guys to give me the semblance of humanity. I am human. Don't you get it? That... Ledo, I always thought that you weren't really uh, a person, a person that understands humanity has nothing to do with you, or humanity don't have anything to do with those things. But now, that statement says it all. There is hatred for men. In other words, Egberto Willis has hatred for men who try to give people who look like me. Hey, Norman, you're black. Uh, I think so, a couple more in here are black. These other three white guys were telling you, you are okay, man. <laughs> Clap. You are okay. Another group says that, and you hate them for actually giving you a piece of humanity? Do you understand the inhumanity? Do you understand the insult of that statement? Because what you just gave, what you just thought is you had the power to give. You see, that is what I've been teaching a whole lot of folks around the world. No, no, no. No, absolutely not, sir. Let me tell you, folks, it's the same thing I tell women. It's the same thing I tell black people. It's the same thing I tell Latinos. It's the same thing I tell everybody that is considered someone who somebody aggrieved. Do not give them, do not give a man, woman, listen to me. Do not give a man ever the power over you or your body. Latinos, do not give anybody ever the power to you, for you to decide what you want. Nobody has that power. You are a human being. Every single entity that speaks a language is a human being. And as a human being, do not allow anybody to think they have something over you. And that is how we take our country back. By not giving anyone some belief that they have the power to define that you are human. Daniel Ledo, you have no power. The founding fathers had no power to determine that black people were human. They were already human. They were the evil ones. Those who enslaved were the evil ones. Those who dropped the atomic bomb were the evil ones. Those who held back women were the evil ones. Those who killed the Indians were the evil ones. Those who forced the Chinese in slave labor, they were the evil ones. We are not rewriting history on politics done right, sir. We won't. We will not rewrite history on politics done right. We tell it like it is, and we tell the truth like it is. And my listeners, I love you all. You know you tell the truth. I'm going over one minute because I got to say, folks, 
Sorry for, for getting a bit excited there, but Daniel Ledo hit the magic number that I want all of you. And this, what Daniel Ledo said there had nothing to do with black people. It had everything to do with the power of white men like him, not my white brothers and sisters, but like him to come out there and try to attempt to show a superiority over everybody else. You, women, Latinos, Indians, and everybody else. Don't you ever forget that. Anyhow, folks, Politics Done Right does need your support. We need your support to be able to tell the truth. We need your support to be able to talk and make sure that the Dan Daniel Ledo's, the fallacies that they put out there, the, the, the air of superiority that they allow some to have even over themselves, that that doesn't get fomented. And for that, we have to have truth tellers, folks that are fearless in telling that story. So please, go to store.politicsdoneright.com. Please go to store.politicsdoneright.com. Get, get one of our books. As I see it, class warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom. It really puts your mind at ease. It really teaches a whole lot of stuff. You can get that at Amazon.com, but if you want to take out the middleman, go to store.politicsdoneright.com. You can also, uh, if you want to become a member, I ask you so kindly to become members. Please go to uh, patreon.com slash politicsdoneright. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash Politics Done Right. Again, that is P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Politics Done Right. You can also provide contributions to this program to make sure that we move forward with our message at paypal.me slash Politics Done Right. paypal.me slash Politics Done Right. I want to thank you so kindly for listening to me. And I love, let me tell you folks before I go, I love that we have right-wingers that come and visit the show. I love that we have people with other points of view so that we, in real time, can make corrections to those points of views that sometimes draw people in. Okay? When they come, when the three-fifths of a person is an ideal thing to show and bring out exactly the mentality of people, when they think they can be the one affording humanity, everybody listening to my voice... You are powerful. You are empowered. Please, women, everybody, women, aggrieved white men, Latinos, Italianos, Chinese, everybody, I want you to never cede your power, never cede your humanity to nobody. No matter how they try. We are all human beings and we are all worthy. We all have the same worth as human beings. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this baby. I am what? Out! Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. <laughs>